80% of our jobs could be affected by GPTs. Surprisingly, people who make more money are at a higher risk, and that is even disregarding the biggest time suck in corporate jobs. GPTs are GPTs. An early look at the labor market impact potential of large language models. At first glance, it's a really weird title, but it's actually really clever. The first GPT means Generative Pre-trained Transformer, like GPT-4 by OpenAI, BARD by Google, and LAMA by Meta. The second GPT stands for General Purpose Technology. Here is a list of them. The most commonly mentioned ones are electricity, computer, and internet. These are technologies that have impact on the entire economy. Internet is the best example because it's the most recent. Few of us can imagine life without wheels and domesticated plants. So much of what we do today is relying on internet and it's very hard to disconnect. This paper investigates whether GPTs can have a similar impact like the internet and the other general purpose technologies. So what is the biggest time suck at work? For me, it's definitely meetings. Let me know in the comments below if you agree or disagree. I'll explain why this study did not look at meetings in detail and how easy it will be to save time with GPTs in the future. So stay tuned until the end. So let's have a look at exactly what they did in this paper. They proposed a new rubric for understanding LLM capabilities and their potential effects on jobs. So in this paper, they use LLM, which is large language model, and GPTs interchangeably, which is kind of annoying, just stick to one term because not all uh, large language models are GPTs. The paper's primary contributions are to provide a set of measurements of large language models impact potential. As a basis, they use this ONET 27.2 database, which contains information on 1,016 occupations and their respective detailed work activities, so DWAs. You will see that throughout the paper. There are a total of 2,087 DWAs, and 19,265 tasks. Task is something smaller. It can be associated with um, the detailed work activity and vice versa. Not all of them are associated with at least one, but generally a task is associated with uh, direct work activity. The database has a huge list of occupations. So here are the title of occupations. Here's the task and here's the detailed work activity. And it's extremely long data set. And you can see each occupation has multiple tasks and multiple detailed work activities. And then they assess the exposure of these tasks and detailed work activities to GPTs. Here is the exposure matrix they used. So no exposure, direct exposure, and LLM plus extra exposed. So no exposure means something manually like dishwasher. Um, some, somebody doesn't use a computer at all, like a garbage collector and things like that. Direct exposure means that using only the current technology, so the current language models or GPT-4, they can decrease the time required to complete the task or detailed work activity by at least 50%. And the E2 category means that access to large language model alone would not reduce the time required to complete a task uh, right now. But additional software or integration of the large language models or GPT-4 could eventually result in decrease of the time it takes to perform the task by 50%. And then they collected both human and GPT-4 generated annotations using the exposure rubric, which underlied the bulk of the analysis in this paper. So what they did, they scored the tasks and the detailed work activities by humans and also by GPT-4 itself, which is kind of meta, it's kind of funny. And that pretty much is the source of all the data in the paper and all the graphs they're showing is analysis of this particular data. They mentioned that the group that labeled the data is not occupationally diverse, potentially leading to biased judgments regarding GPT's reliability and effectiveness in performing tasks with unfamiliar occupations. So what this means is that people who label the data don't know exactly what all the different occupations do. So they might not exactly know what uh, like an agricultural worker does. So they might have overscored what GPT can do or underscored because they're just not exactly familiar with the occupations. One thing that is pretty interesting is that the human ratings and the ratings by GPT-4 do correlate pretty well. So if there was a perfect correlation, this would be a straight line. And you can see uh, for uh, the tasks where GPT cannot perform the task, so this would be mostly manual tasks, there is a really good correlation. At the top end, there is more variability, which does make sense because uh, some humans might overestimate or underestimate what uh, the GPTs can do. They process the data further and they assign labels alpha, beta, and zeta. So alpha is just the uh, language models in the current stage. Beta means uh, the current language models and 50% weight uh, for future technologies, implementation of the GPTs. And zeta is the full uh, language models in current stage and full implementation of uh, them with the other technologies. And the big summary is that 80% of workers belong to an occupation 
with at least one task exposed to GPTs, while 19% of workers are in an occupation where over half of the tasks are labeled as exposed. Another highlight is that science and critical thinking skills are strongly negatively associated with exposure. On the other hand, programming and writing skills show a strong positive association with exposure. And I think we've seen this already with the examples uh, from GPT-4. It's very good at coding, it's very good at writing, it's also pretty creative. So uh, I think these jobs are going to change. Here they highlight the exposure to GPTs uh, based on the annual wage. So on the x-axis, we have annual wage and uh, log scale. Uh, these are the same graph. This is the human rating and this is the GPT-4 rating. And you can see on the low end, there is uh, very little exposure to GPTs because these are mostly manual jobs like gardeners, dishwashers, roofers. And then as you go higher, the exposure increases. And that makes sense because a lot of people who make a lot of money um, don't use their hands um, to work, except maybe like surgeons and dentists. It's mostly knowledge thinkers. And knowledge thinkers spend a lot of time writing emails, writing uh, memos and reports, and a lot of that uh, work will be able to be done by GPTs in the future. If you're getting value from this content, please subscribe to this channel so you don't miss out any future videos. Let's look at actual occupations that are most risk. So here are the human ratings, alpha, beta, and zeta. So alpha is uh, kind of the current technology with the GPTs only. Beta is like half and half. And uh, zeta is uh, when GPTs are fully integrated with other tools. At the most risk currently are interpreters and translators. That makes sense to me. I use Google Translate all the time and it works uh, really, really well. For the beta category, we have writers and authors. So when they implement this tool into, uh, let's say Microsoft Office, uh, it might decrease the time needed for writing us uh, quite substantially because GPT-4 will be able to give you a pretty good draft right uh, off the bat. And uh, when we have full integration of GPTs with other systems, they put uh, as 100% exposures mathematicians. I find that quite uh, surprising that it popped up. It's also for humans and also for the GPT-4 uh, model. Here they put mathematicians at 100% even for the beta which is pretty surprising to me because when we scroll back up here, it says science and critical thinking skills are strongly negatively associated with exposure. So I guess they don't consider math to be science. GPT-4 is pretty impressive when it comes to math. It can do uh, proofs for you essentially instantly. But I think that high level mathematics is actually extremely creative. And uh, I don't see that would be replaced by GPTs anytime soon. And here we have the other side of the spectrum occupations without any exposed tasks. So these are pretty much all manual jobs. So cooks, salmon masons, cutters, dishwashers, uh, electrical power line installers. So that makes perfect sense. Uh, GPTs are currently trapped inside computer. They can't really do physical tasks. Uh, there is the Palm E model that has um, uh, been integrated into a robot. So that can do some physical tasks, but it's still very primitive. Uh, so in the future, I think some of these tasks will also be replaced by artificial intelligence when we have the Tesla bot. But since GPTs are living only inside the computer and these jobs don't essentially use computers at all uh, to do their job, um, these are fully protected as of right now. Here's the correlation between GPT exposure and education acquired. Here in job zone one, we have education acquired, high school diploma uh, or similar, and uh, preparation required none or little. And as you can see here, the exposure to GPTs is very, very low. So 0.03 to 0.08. So this will be mostly manual jobs. So they're not at risk by being replaced by GPTs. On the other hand, the higher you go. So in uh, job zone five, we have master's degree or higher. So this will be professional degrees like pharmacists, lawyers, astronomers. The exposure is much higher. With the current tools is anywhere between 10 to 20%. And uh, once GPTs are fully integrated, up to 60 to 70%. So I think it makes sense because a lot of people who work in these type of jobs uh, spend a lot of time on their computer and in meetings, making presentations, writing documents. And a lot of that will be able to uh, be done faster with GPTs. And what's funny, they have this LLM assistant statement. GPT-4 and ChatGPT were used for writing, coding, and formatting assistance in this project. So I guess we can safely say that the jobs of the researchers have also exposure to GPTs. So are GPTs truly GPTs? So they um, say the classification that requires to be a general purpose technology, it needs to meet three core criteria. First, improvement over time. Second, pervasiveness throughout the economy. And third, ability to spawn complementary innovations. 
and that's by a paper from 2005. They argued that the large language models actually do fulfill all of these three criteria, but I think it's too early to classify uh, generative pre-trained transformer models as general purpose technologies. I think to truly say that something is a general purpose technology can only be done after the technology has become a general purpose technology for a long amount of time. I think if you look at internet in 1995, 1998, it was really hard to gauge what it's going to do. Even when the iPhone came out, some people made fun of it. It's not going to make a big deal. It's going to be like a fax machine. It won't have a big impact on the economy. And now everybody has a smartphone and it's hard to imagine the world without them. Artificial intelligence in general will definitely be a general purpose technology without any question. How long that's going to take, it's not entirely sure. What are the GPT models who become so important? I think it's a little bit too early to tell, um, but they're definitely very impressive and very useful. So why didn't they look at meetings in detail in this study? They have in this section sources of disagreement. They said, while we did not regularly examine the sources of disagreement, we found a few places where humans and the model tended to get stuck in their assessment. And the first bullet is important. Tasks or activities, well, while a large language model could theoretically help or accomplish the task, adopting it to do so would require multiple people to change their habits or expectations. And here, for example, meetings and negotiations. And that's the only place where they mention meetings in the entire paper, which is really interesting because when I worked in Big Pharma, I spent anywhere between 10 on the really low end to 30 hours per week in meetings. So that was definitely by far the biggest time suck for me. And I think large language models and GPTs have a actually a huge potential to change how people spend time at work. So I would say there are three different types of meetings. First, you have meetings where you don't contribute at all. Second, you have meetings where you contribute very little, like a couple minutes. And the third is the meetings that you run or you're presenting. So let's go one by one. In meetings where you don't contribute at all, so this would be like a seminar or a big, large uh, department meeting where you are like a low-level scientist, you're not expected to say anything. I think with the rise of GPTs, we should not attend those meetings at all. First, every meeting will have to be recorded, which for some companies, this might actually be the biggest hurdle because uh, people might resist that to be recorded all the time. But let's say that happens. I think if it comes from a higher management, it will happen. So when a meeting is recorded, then you will get a perfect transcript of every meeting. So why would you go to the meeting live if you don't have to contribute and you can just go through the transcript uh, at any later date? If there are any slides, that will be recorded as well. You can use the search function to look for things that are the most interesting to you. The only downside is that you can ask questions in real time, but from what I've seen when I worked in the industry, people are not really asking that many questions in these big meetings anyway. Or you can ask GPT-4 to write you kind of like a summary of the meeting. So instead of like an hour, two hour meeting, you can ask GPT to write a summary and you're done in five minutes. Then the last uh, meeting where you run the meeting or uh, you're presenting, obviously you'll have to go to that one. But generally that's a meeting that's mostly in control. So you should think about whether you actually have to conduct the meeting in the first place. And the middle category is the most interesting. So these are meetings that I attended all the time when I worked in pharma. Those were like big project meetings where I did have to attend. There was an update expected from me, but the update usually was like minute to five minutes long. If there was a longer update, then I would know it's a longer update. I have to prepare a presentation. So I would say with the rise of GPTs and good transcription technology, even those meetings I will not have to attend in the future. So when a meeting is conducted, it will be transcribed real time and real time a GPT like model will be uh, analyzing what's being said. And based on previous meetings of the similar type, it will be able to tell me exactly when my section is coming up and it will be able to ping me to tell me when I need to log back in. I think this is already happening. I attend a lot of meetings where they would ask, hey, John, can you provide an update? And there would be a silence for like 10, 15 seconds. And uh, then uh, John would pop on and be like, oh, sorry, I was talking on mute. They were not talking on mute. They were doing something else and they were not ready for the question because they're not actively listening. So I think GPTs will make this a lot more efficient. It will uh, be able to transcribe what's happening uh, real time. It will be able to alert you and it can even give you a summary of what has been said. So you can just read the summary real quick and then respond in real time. People spend an enormous amount of time in meetings. And I think if you could save in five, 10 hours every week, that would be absolutely huge. I think this reduction of time in meetings is possible with the current technology that we have right now. All you need is Microsoft Teams to record the meetings. Then you need some type of a model that will transcribe what is being said. Your phone can do that right now. 
and then you need to employ a GPT like model to analyze what's being said and uh, give you kind of ability to ping you whenever you need it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next video.